You've always wondered whatever happened to Striper. Well, we're, we're back in action. Come on, guys. Come on down. And uh, we're here. This is it, people. That's right. Yeah, all you 80s folks, you actually got who Striper was, but that's right. But uh, look at this, folks. We got, uh, this is actually unity in the body of Christ in action. What's the Bible say? How blessed it is when brothers dwell together in unity, right? And if you guys know, this is not just a jacket. It's not mustard. It's not canary. It's Velveeta. Remember that? Somebody said it was Velveeta. Well, guess who said it was Velveeta? And as Christians, we're not supposed to, you know... Do eye for an eye for tooth for tooth. We just buy them the same jacket and make them wear it in public. <laughs> that's how you maintain unity in the body of Christ. But that's right. But hey, give it up for the cheese bros. Cheese powers activate. Nice. Oh, hey, speaking of Striper, Brian had a new name for the band. What was the name of the band? The Three Slices. Three Slices, Velveeta, huh? All right, give it for the cheese bros. That's right. This is awesome. Man, that's just closing prayer. That was just a Bible in a nutshell. That's right. But hey, we also had uh, yesterday, if you weren't here, you missed a, a highlight. It's our first ever homeschool high school graduation ceremony. We had four graduates that we uh, got to see there uh, for 2022. We had Josiah, we had my son Billy again, and Brianna and Alina. And so we want to congratulate them finishing homeschool high school. Why is that? Because the secular school system's a sewer pipe. That's right. Uh, whoever said that, it's a sewer pipe. And that's why we want to get your kids away from that and get them into an environment where they're taught not just the scripture, but a good godly education. Amen. Uh, we need to do that. So we want to congratulate them. So if you see them after service, give them five bucks, take them out, do something. Uh, you know what to do. But uh, anyway, so, hey, we want to welcome you here. If this is your first time with us and you're wondering, what in the world kind of a church is this? You people are freaky. Uh, but, hey, we love God, and we think it's not a crime to be Christians and have joy. You know, what a, what a joy that is. But, hey, we want to encourage you, if you're here for the first time or if you've yet to fill out one of these Connect cards with us, somewhere near you should be one if you can fill that out with some basic information. you got some check boxes, a blank there for prayer requests or other questions you might have. And if you could put it in one of the two offering boxes as we exit, that would be greatly appreciated. So we certainly, again, want to welcome you here, but we want to welcome part of our online family. And today we're going over yonder. You guys know where yonder is? Rhymes with Poland. And we're going to say a big old howdy-ho to Margo. She's been tuning into our studies in Poland. And you're going like, where's that? Well, thanks for asking. It works well with this next slide. It's right there. All right. It's right there. But anyway, that's right. We're over here. I need to get a little cow or something over there so we can see where it's at. But she's over there in Poland, uh, tuning into our studies. And what a joy and a treat it is that we could share God's truth, not here in Vegas, but around the world. And we have our brothers and sisters in Christ tuning in, getting encouraged in God's truth. So on the count of three, we're going to say a big old howdy-ho to Margo in Poland. One, two, three. That's right. And so we want to encourage our online family. If you want to become a member, you can do that. Pastor Bobby, as you can see there at the top there, top uh, with the planet behind him, he'll orbit the planet with you. And he will take you into a membership class uh, and, uh, and take you through that via Zoom. And you become a member of Sunrise Bible Church. Also, speaking of which, uh, we have a prayer at getalifemedia.net here locally or part of our online family. If you've got a need, a request, you need some prayer, hey, that's the fastest way to get it to our prayer team. So keep that in mind. Uh, as well. But hey, we also want to encourage you if you're online, our online family, subscribe to the, one of the many different channels and things and outreaches we're on, whether it be YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or Rumble, Gab, MeWe, Telegram, Odyssey. I'm losing count of all the different ones that we're on. And, uh, but uh, I'm not saying that to boast. That's what we're supposed to do. Get God's word out as many ways as we can. But we encourage you to do that. But if you're missing something, where do you go? Getalivemedia.com. And today's no different. We have a special Father's Day reminder of where to go. Give it up for Ricky, Bobby, Andy. That's right. Let's take a look. I want to play my video games. Johnny, I need you to do the announcement for Father's Day. Oh, man. I, just, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Johnny? Okay. Gee. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Pastor Billy and Sunrise Bible Church for my bed attitude. Mm, um, I wanted to, first of all, wish the fathers a uh, happy Father's Day uh, for the things, the cool things they do for us. Um, and I thank my father for uh, teaching me how to play underwater basketball and um, for uh, helping me build my first nuclear submarine. 
But most importantly, I want to thank him for showing me getalifemedia.com. That's get a life, life media dot com. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And um, because he said if I go on there, I will get all the answers for my life. And um, that's it. Can I play my video games now? Can I? Yes, you can, John. Oh, good. <laughs> Give it up for Ricky, Andy, Bobby, Johnny, whoever that was. That's right. Get a like We want to encourage you to go there. And again, if you can get the different studies and DVDs. Why do we encourage you to get the DVDs? Because we don't copyright our material. And if you get them, even if they wipe out all the electronics, burn a billion of them. We don't care. Get it out there. Let's get God's word out as fast as we can, uh, no matter what happens. Amen? Amen? Awesome. Well, hey, we're going to have an offering this morning. If you'd like to partake in that. You're more than welcome to do so. You can just pop it in one of the two offering boxes as we exit. If you're part of our online family and you'd like to partake in this morning's offering, you can do that as well. You can do that three different ways. You can go to the appropriate website, and you could uh, look for the mailing address and mail it in. Or there on the website, you should see donate or give or something like that. You can do that. Or even now, there should be a number appearing on the screen that's your texting option if you choose to text give. And you could give in that fashion. But let's pray for that, and we'll pray for our study. Father, we love you, and thank you so much for today. And we thank you for being such a good, 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 good heavenly father and we just uh thank you for giving us your son jesus christ so that we could call you our heavenly father and have a wonderful relationship with you and we pray that you would bless this day god uh with certainly father's day and that we would be those men who would be those godly examples leading our family in your ways because that's what we need to do that's the highest calling uh, as we follow your example and so we, we thank you for the privilege it is, God, to give of our time, our tongues, our talent, but also our treasure. And if we choose to give today, we pray that we do so as you tell us, not under compulsion, not because we have to, not because we feel weird or guilty about it, but because we're a cheerful giver. We want to. And we just pray that if we do, we ask for your blessings upon it, that you be glorified in this offering, that we, your church, would have whatever resources we need to Keep moving forward for you and hopefully and prayerfully become stronger, more effective disciples for you in these last days. But also that lost souls could be one for you here in Las Vegas, around the world, including in Poland. And we just pray that you would bless it all. And God, now as we turn to your word, give us those ears to hear, hearts to obey what you would share with us today. And as we take one more look at this first acid test from James called trials, as we finish it out, you willing, uh, may we understand it doesn't matter where we're at in life. Whether it's one extreme or the other, whether we're flat out extremely poor or whether you've enabled us to have actually quite a bit. There's no excuse for either category to not still be that joyful witness for you. And so open our hearts, God, to see that it's, it's not about us. It's about being used of you to store up treasure in heaven and living for those eternal riches so that we don't waste or squander our opportunity let alone demonstrate that we're the real deal, that we're a really true born-again Christian, not living for this world, but the world to come. We're in this world, we're just not of it. So God, please help us to be those Christians. And again, as, if, as always, God, if there's anybody here today or watching online that's not truly born again, only you know the heart, please save them before it's too late. May they have the richest thing of all, the gift of eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But please bless our study even now. We ask all this in your wonderful name. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, once again, we're in our study, the book of James. The tagline is, how to spot a phony Christian. Are you serious? Is that real? Uh-huh. We've been seeing the last 17 times that this is not a foreign concept in the scripture. What's the four different ways that God calls out the fakers in our midst? False teachers, false apostles, false prophets, and what? False brothers. What's that? Fakers in our midst. They were there at the early church. And unfortunately, they're in high gear today. Now, the good news is God doesn't just tell us in his word that these people are going to be there in our midst. Okay, the good news is he tells us how to spot them. What's the problem? The church is not looking and being equipped on how to spot them, let alone deal with them. And they're allowing those fakers to go from the pews behind the pulpit. Now, it's been seen on Wednesday nights and in our book of James study that they are now in charge of denominations, Bible colleges, seminaries, and it has messed things up. It's called the apostasy. I'm convinced we have fakers running the church as crazy as that sounds. But hey, we're going to continue in that journey, uh, finding out how to spot a faker. James chapter 1, verse what? 1 through 12. 
That, now, that's a Father's Day present. <laughs> no, yeah, we're cooking now, baby. Double digit Sunday, two Sundays in a row. That's right. James chapter 1, verse 1 through 12. Let's take a look as we close out. Believe it or not, just this first acid test with trials. How do you know if you've got a faker in your midst? Let's take a look. Verse 1 says this. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes, the early church at that time, scattered among the nations. Why were they scattered? To go out there and be my witnesses. Greetings, he says. Then he says, first of all, here it is. Consider it what? Pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face, whoa, trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must. It has to finish its work. Why? Because God's doing something good. So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if in that trial, any of you lacks wisdom, what do you do? You ask God. Why? Because he gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will, not maybe not might, it will be given to him. But, here's your caveat, when he asks, he must what? you got to believe God and what? Not doubt. Why? Because here's what you sow when you doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. You're blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he's going to receive anything from the Lord. Why? Because you're dipsukos, you're a double-sided man, you're unstable in what? All he does. Don't do that. Now, this is what we saw last time. The brother in what? Humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. Remember humble circumstances? Top and us. It means extremely poor. I mean, this guy's got nothing. Remember that? And so he says, what? The person, the Christian, in those circumstances, you ain't got nothing? In your high position? What's he talking about? But, verse 10, the one who is rich, the polar opposite, should take pride in his what? Low position. What's going on there? Well, there's a play on the Greek. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, he says, well, well why, that? why is that? Because he, the rich man, will pass away like a wildflower for the sun rises with scorching heat. Welcome to Vegas. And withers the plant, right? It's blossomed. We know this. The blossom fails and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Here it is. Here's the payoff. Rich or poor, in the context of everything we sell for, if you pass the test, here's what you get. Blessed is the man who perseveres what? under trial. Why? Because when he stood the test, you've proven you're the real deal. Here's what you get. And here's what every born again Christian gets. He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that awesome? That's what we should be looking forward to. Okay. And to maintain our joy, to be a positive witness, which is the context. Okay. Again, we've been seeing that James is the first book chronologically written in the New Testament. It doesn't appear that way in our Bibles, but it is about 40 AD, roughly so. Okay. And the very first thing he does is he starts to give acid tests. How do you know that you got a fake in your midst? Like, well, why would he do that? Because Satan, ever since the birth of the church, Acts chapter two, has been throwing in fakers in the midst of the church to mess things up. Because if he gets enough fakers in there, then they're going to come, uh, a lost person comes in that mix, and they can get a false gospel and a false Jesus, which means they don't get saved, and they join Satan in the lake of fire. Or number two, if he keeps it up, and then the fakers outnumber the real ones, then they could destroy that church, take it over, and frankly, dare I say, that's what we're experiencing today. Okay, so James, right out the gates, man, he throws out, what's the acid test? The first one we've been seeing is trials, and it's not just making it through your trials. Here's how you know you're dealing with a Christian. Number one, do you have joy? In the midst of your trials. Number two, do you submit to God in the midst of your trials? And number three, do you seek God's wisdom in the midst of your trials? And then last time we saw in verses 9 through 10, do you long for eternity in the midst of your trials? And again, that was in verses 9 through 10. Let's recap that again in the context. James 1, 9 through 10 it says this, The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, the extremely poor one. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. Why? Because he's going to pass away like a wildfire. As we saw last time, James now is bringing out a dichotomy of two different classes of Christian. Okay? You're going to have the poor, and the word there, top and us, means extremely poor. This guy's got nothing, man. Not us. Nothing. Okay? As we saw last week, okay? Or it could be the rich one, and that's what we're going to deal with today. But the context here is some Christians are rich, some Christians are wealthy. And they've got, uh, you know, and, and other ones, they're, they're poor. Go around the world. You see that. And it's always been that way, certainly if you read the New Testament, okay? Now, in the context here, James is saying whether you're poor or whether you're rich, whatever extreme you're at, there is no excuse for you to be, what's the context? A joyful witness to Jesus Christ to the people around you, right? It's what he's saying. Now, last time we dealt with the poor aspect, and he says, listen, even if you're extremely poor, I mean, you are literally, it means hugging the ground. This guy ain't got nothing, Right? He's really, really poor. He says, you just got to do two things, and you can still maintain, even in that situation, as a Christian, you can maintain that joy and be a positive witness. The first thing is, you put your temporary, key word there, temporary poverty in perspective. In other words, it's not going to be forever, okay? And one day, it's going to get better. 
which leads to the second thing, and that's primarily what James is saying here. You need to look forward to your eternal riches in Christ, right? And that's what he says here in this verse. The brother in humble circumstances, extreme poverty, literally, ought to take pride in his high position. You say, well, how's that a high position? That's something you should avoid, right? Well, no, he's saying, listen, God's actually blessed you in that position because, listen, the reality is this, okay? A poor poor person, extremely poor person, is more apt to what? Think about your riches that are coming one day in heaven because you ain't got nothing going on down here. And when you do that, the scripture says, as Paul says, keep your mind on things above, not on this earth. And when you see that a born-again Christian, no matter who you are, no matter what economic state you're in, you're truly the richest person on the planet. We're literally going to be walking on streets of gold. It's going to be absolutely amazing and decked out. And that's what he's saying for the poor person. You should be excited that God puts you in that position because you're more apt to get your mind off of this garbage can and onto true riches, and you maintain that joy. Praise God, he's allowed that to happen to you. And basically what we saw is, listen, you might be in that situation. You may not have much to rejoice about in things, as this world would say. You may not have many worldly possessions, but you got eternal riches in Christ. The world might look at you in that economic situation and say, man, you're the filth, you're the scourge of the world. You ain't got much. You, you're, deprived. you're at the lowest economic level. Your body's all messed up and not even working right. And all this. Listen, but listen, payday is coming. It's not going to be forever. One day, all that's going to go bye-bye forever and ever and ever and ever. It's just temporary, right? You may be hungry, but you got the bread of life. You may be thirsty, but you got the water of life. You may be cast aside and rejected, but you've been received by God. You may not have a much of a home here, but wait till you see the one God's building for you. And that, even if you're in extreme poverty, James is saying, you do that, Ooh, you maintain that joy. And then you have the joy of being used of God. To witness to people. Because when you're really in that state and you really got joy. Because we look at those people. Oh, they must be miserable. That's horrible. horrible. But when you see people really in extreme poverty. So full of the joy of the Lord. Wow. That's a witness. And that makes you joyful. Right? Now. You're thinking. Well, wait a second. What about those rich people, man? They're getting off easy. Right? No. James is saying. uh, Don't envy that. Because they got even bigger problems. Right? And that's what we're going to deal with now. Verse 10 through 12 right, is the other end of the spectrum. But the one who is rich, James says, should take pride in his low position because he's going to pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises and with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man, he's going to fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, whatever your economic situation is. Why? Because when you've stood the test, you've proven you're the real deal. He'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Let's Greek out a little bit. Uh, But the one who is wealthy, literally, let him be glorying in his what? Humiliation. It's not a good thing. Brought on by his trials and resulting in his being reduced to the level of a man who is poor and afflicted. Right? Why? Because as the flower of the grass, he shall come to an end, for the sun arises with its scorching heat, and the grass withers, and its flowers fall off, and the beauty is its appearance is destroyed. So shall the wealthy person fade away together with his what? Undertakings. All that you do, all that you have, all that stuff is going to be gone. Spiritually prosperous, though, literally it says in the Greek, is the man who remains steadfast under trial, because after he has met the test and has been approved, you're the real deal, Here's the payoff. You shall receive the crown, namely the crown which has to do with the life, eternal life, which crown he, God, promised to those who love him. Now, let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum. We dealt with the extreme poor person, and we saw, well, that's, that's me, Pastor Billy, because, man, those, those gas prices, I'll tell you what, I ain't got no money. No, no, we saw last week. I'm not going to do that again. We, we, we are more on the other side. We're more on this side. Okay, we are not. The Tapanas Christian, okay? Uh, this one is wealthy. It's plusios. The rich literally is plusios in the Greek. And it means not just wealthy. Watch this. This guy is the complete polar opposite. He is literally abounding in material resources. He is abundantly supplied. He is not a Tapanas uh, Christian. This guy is way above the ground. He's not hugging the ground. He's not sucking the dirt, basically. He, this guy, got, he has no lack. He is at the other end of the spectrum economically. He is well off. He's, he's, he's abounding it. He's got tons of supplies, right? He ain't threatened by this uh, global uh, food shortage and supply chain. He could care less. That's this guy. This is the total opposite spectrum we saw now, here's the problem. Great riches, we're going to see, oftentimes you think, if I just, man, money, and I got it, and it. Great riches often brings great misery. And we're going to demonstrate that, and James says that. And he's actually saying, you should be boasting that God's shown you that now. Because if you go down that route, you're going to be miserable. The polar opposite of joy. 
what you're supposed to be as a witness. But it, great misery, and we know that, right? Or at least we should, right? You hear people that say, hey, I, I just want a million dollars. And typically when people get to the point where they make a million dollars, you know what they literally say right after that? Uh, just maybe one more million. Uh, and then just another one. And it just never stops. You're never satisfied. It's always more. It's not a good existence, right? Okay, either the rich people, the plusias, has so much that they don't think about things above eternal riches, okay, or it creates a whole lot of problems uh, for them, okay? And so it is with us today, okay? And you think, well, I know that, Pastor Billy. I know that, you know, riches can't give you joy. They only comes from God. Well, for those of you that actually speak like that, that was kind of weird, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll love you. We're unity in the body of Christ today. Right, with these jackets. That's right. The spirit of Elvita is all over me. But anyway, seriously, no, we say that, right? Of course we say that. That's the Christian thing to say. I'm going to demonstrate to you that we've been brainwashed, even as Christians, that we still think that riches, a plusios Christian, will give us joy. Right? And I'll, I'm going to just repeat the phrase. Life would be great if I only had enough. You've been brainwashed, haven't you? That's, our world tells us the exact opposite of what the scripture has to say. There's nothing wrong with money. It's what you do with it is what counts. But see, we've been brainwashed to think, if I get more, and maybe a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and it just never stops, and more and more and more, that's when I'll be joyful. See, that's why I can't be joyful now, Pastor Billy, because, I mean, the prices and the economy and the inflation, rah! No. Uh, first of all, don't act like you're poor, because we're nothing like the tapios, Christian. But you got really no excuse. But see, it's messed up your joy because you think that will give you joy. It's out of balance. And this is what James is saying, right? He's trying to get to our heads for the Plusios Christian. Uh, can money bring your loved one back from the dead? There's all kinds of things that money can't do. Can money prevent you from getting in a car wreck? Can money keep you from ever going to the hospital? Can money give you unconditional love? Can money give you character? Can money give you clean conscience? Can money give you immortality? Can money guarantee you'll never come down with a sickness ever? There's all kinds of things that money can't do. And the Bible's very clear. It can't give you joy in and of itself. And certainly the lie that I just need more and more and more and more. Okay? Money typically does two negative things. One, it distracts you from that which is truly important, i.e. spiritual things, i.e. God. A relationship with him and service to him. Because we don't... You want to store up treasure in heaven? It only happens here. You want to witness? We don't witness in heaven. It's here. So it'll distract you from spiritual things, number one. Number two, it often creates more misery, right? And let me demonstrate to you. I've actually had Christians come up to me and say, Pastor Billy, I know I probably shouldn't gamble, but I just play the lottery. And here's my deal. And they will say this. I made a deal with God. <laughs> See, if he lets me win the lottery, then I'm going to give back to the church. Really? You don't even give to the church now. You think God's going to... Are you kidding? <laughs> I've actually had Christians say that. I'm going like, Where, where's your heart, man? Right? But, but see, we've been inside life. I only had enough money. We didn't. On the, oh, yeah, yeah. If, if, the money can't give you joy. But then we live like the world tells us we're supposed to live. It's just about more. Let's look at the people who won the lottery. And you tell me if they had so much joy that they had to pay somebody with those lottery winnings to slap the smile out their face. <laughs> Rhymes with nobody never. Let's take a look. David Lee Edwards, he won $27 million in 2001. In 2001, David Lee Edwards was one of the four winners of Powerball's jackpot. It was worth $280 million. He took the lump sum option. After tax, he received $27 million. Prior to his win, he was unemployed and was living in his parents' basement. Good things happen to lazy people, huh? Hold that thought. He spent his money on a house, cars, a jet, and an expensive wristwatch, bought himself some guns, and then began investing. On top of that, he married a woman 19 years younger. He spent almost a half of his prize money in just a year. His wife was arrested for stabbing a boyfriend. He lost his house to foreclosure. David died in 2013, poor. Evelyn Adams, she won $5.3 million in 1985 and 1986. What do you mean, Alex? Yes, she won the New Jersey Lottery twice. Evelyn's first win was in 1985, and the second one was a year later. In total, she got $5.3 million out of the New Jersey Lottery. She got too cocky with her luck and spent them all on shopping sprees and gambling in Atlantic City. 
She married her fiance and blew through all of it. She now lives in a trailer park. Lou Eisenberg won $5 million in 1981. If we adjust that for inflation, that kind of money would be just under $15 million today. Lou took the annual payment of $120,000 for 20 years, giving him a total of $2.4 million after taxes. He received his last check in 2001. He bought a house in Florida and went traveling to Europe. He also gambled a lot of it and gave away cash to whoever he thought needed it. After his last check, he went broke. He is now living in a mobile home. Jack Whitaker, he won $314.9 million in 2002. Okay, how do you blow through almost $315 million? This is incredible. Unlike the others on this list, Jack was already a millionaire when he won the lottery. He has a successful business with over 100 employees under its roof. Turns out money is the worst thing that could have happened to him. He bought a $93 million house in Texas and then started hitting the high-end strip clubs. He started gambling big sums of money, his house was robbed, thieves took hundreds of thousands of dollars from him, and his daughter, who at the time was addicted to drugs, was later murdered. Keith Howard Nicholson, he won 152,319 pounds in 1961. That's a lot of money for the early 60s. Adjusted to inflation, that's around five to six million dollars. Keith Howard Nicholson was the Littlewoods football pool. His wife took control over the money. She spent and kept spending. She was so famous with her spending, there was even a London musical based on her story. It was titled, Spend, Spend. And spend. Keith died in a car accident and it turned Vivian to depression and alcohol addiction. She lost everything. In order to survive, she even worked as a stripper for several years. Michael Carroll won 9 million pounds in 2002. Just four years later, he was broke and in jail. How did it happen? He just blew it all off. He spent most of his money on parties, hookers, and cocaine. This is a tragic story of a Chicago lottery winner, Yuruj Khan. Yuruj won a million dollars in 2012. Just a day later, he lost it all. He died just a day after he received the ceremonial check you see in the picture. Yuruj was found dead and his body went through a forensic autopsy. The autopsy revealed that he died of cyanide poisoning. The suspects were his sister-in-law and her father, but no one was charged. Callie Rogers, she won 1,875,000 pounds in 2003. Callie Rogers is the youngest person to ever win a lottery in the United Kingdom. She was only 16 years old when she received approximately $2.7 million. She might have been too young to be handed millions as she recklessly spent her money on parties, drugs, and plastic surgery. She kept spending until she had nothing left. When she realized she blew through it all, she attempted suicide. Sharon Terabazzi won a lottery in 2004. It was a $10.5 million lottery jackpot. She spent the money on vacations with her friends right away. She went to Vegas, Florida, California, and the Caribbean with an itinerary. Then she spent her money on a wedding. She bought a $515,000 house and a $200,000 car. That wasn't the only car. Only three years later, she blew through half of the money. Then her husband was arrested for a DUI. As if it was not bad enough, she lost her house in the same year. She is now working at a part-time job to pay the rent and support her kids on her own. Abraham Shakespeare, he won $30 million in 2006. The last name should have predicted the tragic end. In 2006, he won the Florida Lotto jackpot for $30 million. When you get rich, people get nice to you. Abraham got a lot of new friends. Unfortunately, one of them was the one who ended his life. Her name was Doris Moore, also known as Dee Dee. She tricked Abe into believing she was only trying to protect him from family and friends hounding him for money. Before Abe went missing in 2009, he transferred all his assets to Dee Dee. In 2012, she was proven to have murdered Abe. So much for making your life better. See, I made a deal with God, Pastor Billy, if I win the lottery. No, okay, I don't play the lottery. I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to gamble. I'm just waiting for that uh, relative to die. 
give me an inheritance. That sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. You hear people getting saved. It's the same thing. The inheritance out of the blue, what do they do? They blow it all. They get into serious trouble. Their lives are just like that. In fact, I'll tell you uh, one story. This actually happened in, in a, another church that I pastored. It was the sickest. I've never seen such dripping greed that literally destroyed a family in seconds. And it was a, a very wealthy Christian. Because we're going to see in the context here, there's, it's not like every, every, every good Christian is a poor Christian. You can only live in a cardboard box. You can't have nothing nice. That's not what the scripture says. It's what you do with it is what matters. But So these Christians, they were very wealthy. Big ranching family. The husband, the father, had already passed away, so it was just down to the mom. Knew the mom very well, both my wife and I. Very wonderful, godly woman. Prayed with her so many times, and all she ever wanted from her kids was for them to be saved, and she joined her and the father in heaven. That's all she wanted. She died. Her body, I'm not joking, was not even cold. Her corpse was not cold, and bang, they pounced it on that. I'm getting the phone calls, ring a ling a ling Lawyers are involved. Who's getting this? It was the nastiest, ugliest thing ever. And your mom is not even, we haven't even had... She's been dead like 30 minutes. I, I just maybe wanted to puke. But see, if I just get, you know, okay, maybe not the water, but in the air, just, yeah, I'm just waiting for that dead one to die. Prodigal son. What was going on with that story? What was so egregious about his behavior? His dad wasn't dead, but he just basically said, give me my inheritance. He's basically saying, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. Oh, yeah, that inheritance, that helps out a lot. Oh, no, no, no. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show my talent. I mean, you'd heard about the new band. We're going to give ZZ Top a run for their money. Three slice in Vegas, man. Oh, by the way, Brian really can. He's a guitarist, very accomplished. Not to build you up. And he can shred. <laughs> Get it? Cheese? Cheese, people? Come on. If I have to explain it, you ruin it. Okay? But we're going to go rich and famous, right? That's what Hollywood says. If you just get enough money, you be rich and famous. And yeah, yeah then, I'll, then I'll start living for God. Yeah, whatever. Or sports figures. I'm going to show them all this stuff. That, you know, as me, obviously, you guys know I walked away from a serious NBA basketball career. Yeah, that's called a lie. Although for a very brief period, I was inspired by Spud Webb. Remember him? Yes, people like me could really make it. No. But anyway, I digress. Um, no, that's what we say. Hollywood sports figure crunch because they got millions of dollars. And we all know. I mean, look at the tabloids. Look at the media. Those people are always so full of joy. And, and they, they literally do have to pay people to stop smiling. Stop smiling. Are you kidding me? What's with their lives? It's all messed up. Scandals and drugs and murders and suicide and divorce and breakups. And... But we say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a Christian. Joy comes from God. But what do we do? We give into this lie. If I just had enough money, lottery, inheritance, rich and famous. But maybe they didn't have enough. Maybe they need to be not just like Hollywood elite, and they got millions. But if they had millions like Elon Musk or, you know, Bill Gates, huh? that's where joy... We've seen this before. Let's take a look at what happened to these guys. They had more money than you and I could ever shake a stick at. The richest men. The president of the largest independent steel company, Charles Schwab, died bankrupt, lived on borrowed money for five years before he died. The president of the largest utility company, Samuel Insull, died a fugitive from justice and penniless in a foreign land. The president of the largest gas company, Howard Hobson, he went insane. The greatest wheat speculator, Arthur Cotton, died abroad insolvent. The president of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Whitney, spent time in the famous Sing Sing Penitentiary. A member of the president's cabinet, Albert Fall, he was pardoned from prison just so he could die at home. The greatest bear on Wall Street, Jesse Livermore, he died a suicide. The head of the greatest monopoly, Ivan Kruger, he died a suicide. The president of the Bank of International Settlements, Leon Fraser, died a suicide. Anybody seen a pattern here? I mean, God says in his word, and we say we believe it. But we run after that. And then we say, well, that's why I'm not joyful, because, you know, I just got to have more money. And this is what James is saying. He's trying to get to our heads. Uh, 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 listen, you guys are definitely not, myself included, you're not the tapping out Christian. Don't even be tempted. The gas prices are so high. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just hugging the ground, Pastor Billy. I ain't got, no, no. We saw it last week. This is extreme poverty. We don't know anything about that. But where we're at is we're doing just fine. But don't make the mistake of the endless trap. I just got to have more. And see, that's why I can't be joyful now because everything's just going through the roof and I just got to have more. So what James says, don't do it. For the Plusios Christians, 
You have no excuse for not having continued joy. Just like the poor Christian, there's two things you need to do to maintain that joy, even in the midst of your situation. And the first one is you need to be thankful, James says, for this position that God's put you in. Okay, and this is what he says here in verses 10 through 11. Let's Greek out again. Let him be glorying in his what? Humiliation with your riches. You're humiliated with that. What? We'll get to that in a second. Brought on by his trials and resulting in his being reduced to the level of man who is poor and afflicted. Right? Then he says, because of the, the flower of the grass, he shall come to an end for the sun arises with its scorching heat and the grass withers and the flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. And so James is telling the rich Christian, the Plusios, uh, you need to, number one, be glad and thankful that God puts you in this, listen, humbling position to see that no amount of money can give you joy on earth. And if that's where you're at, you're headed for a train wreck and you're missing the point and you'll never be joyful. And you'll miss out on being that positive witness. Remember, this is the context. This is the early church that had finally gone out into the world to be my witnesses. And joy is a powerful way to let people know there's something better to live for than this garbage can down here. So whether you're rich, whether you're poor, you can joy and they can lead people to Christ. And James is saying, you better be glad. If you're in that position and you're well-to-do as a Christian, certainly way better than the tapping on this Christian, you better be glad that God showed you that now because he is sparing you from the polar opposite of joy, grief. We'll get to that in a second. But that's what literally what the Greek word, let him be glorying in his humiliation. The word there, humiliation, here's your play on the Greek, is tapinosis. It's, it's, it's a verb. Remember, tapios? Tapinos, was, that's an adjective. That's, he's extremely poor. He's hugging the ground. Well, this guy with his riches, he's been made to be low is what Paul is literally saying. So let me explain to you what he's saying. James is saying to the Tapanos Christian last week, you are actually exalted by God because God has shown you through your extreme poverty that you can still have continual joy and you can still be a positive witness and leading souls to people with a powerful testimony that you're still full of joy even though you're extremely poor. And then, so James flips it around now and he says, for the Plusios Christian, the rich one, you should be glorying the fact that God made you see the low truth, Tapanosis, that riches can't give you joy here on earth here and now. And you say, well, why do I need to know that? Why is that such a big deal? Why, why should I be going, woohoo, thank you, God, for showing me that riches are not where I'm going to get joy? Because he's sparing you for something. It's called grief. Like this guy. There's this rich industrialist. He was disturbed to find this fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. And he goes up to him and says, hey, why ain't you out there fishing? And the fisherman says, well, because I, I caught enough fish for today. And the rich guy says, well, why don't you catch more fish than you need? And the fisherman says, well, what would I do then? And the rich guy says, well, you could, you could earn more money. And you could buy a better boat. So you can go deeper and catch even more fish. And then you could purchase nylon nets and catch even more fish. And make even more money. And then soon you'd have a fleet of boats and you'd be rich like me. And the fisherman says, well, then what would I do? He says, <laughs> the rich guy, he says, then, then you can sit down and enjoy life. And the fisherman looks out the sea and he goes, what do you think I'm doing now? <laughs> this is what James is saying, folks. He's trying to spare you from this. Right? He's trying to get through your head. Doesn't matter what end of the spectrum you're at. You're extremely poor. You can still have joy. But don't ruin your ability, even if you're wealthy, to have joy by thinking that that joy comes from your wealth. Or the endless pursuit of, i got to have more, 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 more. And this is exactly what Paul, now Paul's going to kick in on. James says it, Paul says it, we're going to see Jesus said it. It's the same thing, the same passage. You can't find joy in riches in and of themselves. There's certainly more of it. And this is what Paul says to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. But godliness with what? What's the word there? Content. Contentment is what? Not just gain, great gain, right? Why? Because we brought nothing in this world. Guess what? You ain't taking nothing out of it. Did you know there's actually people who have been buried in their cars? I think one was like a pink Cadillac, somebody, some 57 Chevy or something, and then, cat, I mean, it's here, people, well, yeah, the worms really appreciated that. They had about five years going, woo put the sh worm shades on, you know, their, their worm tail over the, looking cool with the seat back, yeah, thank you, man, this is great. It's stupid, what? People being buried with all their jewels, and went, hey, thanks for the worms. Are you serious? You can't take it with you. And, of course, he's quoting Job. Right? You think that's common sense, but here's what he says. And he's talking to the church. He said, but if we got food and clothing, we should be what? There's that word again. Content. Right? How many of you guys got food? 
many of you guys glad besides me that you're actually wearing clothes today? <laughs> oh, how many of you guys are doing so well that uh, the band is back? <laughs> three slice, three slice. We got clothes, right? We, so what? We should be content with that. It's good. Life is good. We're rich. Woo! Joy. No. He said, here's the problem. You listen to the world, this is what you get. Those who want to get rich, you know, in inheritance or if I could be rich and famous, if I could have more money, uh, another million or this thing and that, and about all these things or win the lottery. Uh, he, what's he say? That's a temptation. It's not just a temptation. Here's what it's designed to do. It'll destroy you. And a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into what? Blessedness and happiness. <laughs> no, ruin and destruction are the words there. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Listen, some people eager for money. If I only had enough. Here's what you get. They've wandered from the faith and they pierce themselves with many grief. Now let's bust that baby down. Here's what that word means. Grief. This is what God's trying to spare you from. This is why you should be boasting. Yeah, God, thank you for sharing me that no matter how much I got, I, this endless thing, I got to have more and inherit one. It's just never enough. I'm not content. I just got to have more and more. Thank you for sparing me that because this is what you'll get. Grief. It's odune in the Greek. And it means, listen, not just, yeah, grief. You know, yes, no, no. Little pain, little sorrow. What's the word there? What's the operative? Consuming grief. I mean, you can't get rid of it. It just won't stop. Every day you wake up, it's still there. Ah! Consuming grief, ah, consuming pain, so I just can't give it. Ah, how did this happen to me? Because you thought you gave into the temptation that money could give you joy. And now you're consumed with that lie. And here's your payoff. I can't get rid of this grief. Just this pain it keeps causing. I got no joy, it's just sorrow. Why? Because what does he say? It comes, it goes. The flower of the grass comes to an end, so riches come to an end. Right? That's what he says. In fact, that's what he says. The sun arises with scorching heat, right? And the grass withers and its flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. I'm actually trying to plant in planter boxes a garden in my backyard. I was doing so good until about last week. And I go out one day and all it takes was one day. <laughs> what happened to my plants? Curse you, son. <laughs> it happened just like that. I was like, why are you kidding me? I paid me these things. Oh, I'm so excited. I was going to actually get the bell pepper. <laughs> and it just. <laughs> and that's what he's saying here. It's like, come on, we should know this. Riches, they're here today. They're gone tomorrow. They just, they just fade away. And then you're living like that. It's just, what a waste. All your accomplishments is going to go. So, so show also the wealthy person fade away together with your undertakings, right? You live for money. You think that's where it's all in. And that's all you do. That's all your, that's your undertakings. You're not using your wealth for the things that could give you joy. We'll get to that in a second. Oh, no, it's just about more. I got more. And he says, listen, what did you do? How, and we've, how many times have we learned this? One plunge in the stock market, bang. And if you put your joy in that, where's your joy now? You ain't got no joy. Grief, sorrow, consuming. Ah, oh, stop it. Don't do that. I'm not saying don't be wise, but it comes and goes. It, it's, it's not permanent. And James is saying, don't do that. God's trying to spare you from a horrible life. Okay? Stack it in your coffin all you want, but riches ain't going with you. The buildings you build one day is going to crumble. The edifice is that you put all your hope in your name. <laughs> it's going to fall apart one day. All that real estate you purchase, one day is going to be purchased by somebody else. All the money that you eventually hoarded someday is going to go to somebody else, and they'll probably blow it. So be glad, James says, that God is showing you this now. Be thankful for putting you in that humbling tabernosis position that you could realize that it's a poor truth thinking that money can give you joy. Do you get it? That's his play on the Greek there. Okay, And he's trying to save you from a self-inflicted life of consuming pain and grief and sorrow. Like this guy. And then we'll move on to the next point. He said, there's this rich guy, right? He was near death and he was grieved because he read the Bible and what we just saw, I just can't take it with you. 
right? But he worked so hard for his money, man. That's all he lived for. And so he wanted to be able to take at least some of it with him to heaven. So he began to pray and he, he that, that, oh, I got to be able to take some of my wealth with me. And so an angel heard his plea and appeared to him and says, hey, I'm sorry, but you can't take your wealth with you. And the man says, come on, man. He's important today. Would you just speak to God and see if he'll bend the rules a little bit? And so, so the angel, he goes off to God and he reappears to the rich man. And he informs that, hey, okay, God's decided you to take one suitcase. That's it. Right? And so now he's overjoyed, the rich guy, right? And so he gathers his largest suitcase he can find. He crams it, listen, with pure gold bars. And he sticks it right beside his bed. Well, sure enough, soon afterward, the rich man dies, and he shows up at the pearly gates of heaven. And who's he meet? St. Peter. He's always there. I don't know why. But uh, that's how it always works. Uh, so St. Peter, he, he comes in, he checks in, and, and he says, hey, 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 wait a second. Hold on. You can't bring that in here. And the man says, no, Peter, you need to go check it out. I got permission, right? So Peter goes, verifies the story with the Lord, and he comes back. He says, oh, okay, all right, all right. You, you, okay, you, you're right. You're allowed one carry-on bag. But I'm supposed to check the contents before I let you through. So St. Peter, he opens up the rich man's suitcase, and all of a sudden he starts laughing. He goes, you got to keep it. Are you serious? You brought pavement? <laughs> That's what James is saying. Plusios Christian, he's trying to spare you from odune, consuming grief and sorrow. Because one day, we're going to be walking on gold as pavement. So stop living for gold here, thinking that pavement in heaven is going to give you joy. It's not going to work. No excuse. Now, let's move on to the second one. Because again, riches are not bad. Right? Sometimes God has Christians that are poor. And believe it or not, if you read the scripture, God makes some Christians wealthy because he wants you to be a channel of blessing. Money's not bad. It's what you do with it. And that's what we see here. The second thing in the rich guy, the Plusios Christian, you need to be fruitful with your position. Not only thankful that God showed you that riches here on earth can't give you joy, but he gave you those riches to do something. Listen, and if you do it right, it will give you joy. Not the riches, but the act of giving it away. In Christ's name. And that's what we see here is the payoff for the poor or the rich. And that's in verse 12 as he wraps it up. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Why? Because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, the key word there is blessed. Okay, it's the Greek word makaros. And it doesn't just mean spiritually prosperous. The idea is with happiness or dare I say it's even stronger, joy. So this person is full of joy. They're not just, hey, that's a spiritually mature person. It's somebody that is full of joy. And this is what uh, James is trying to get through the rich person's head. Okay, listen, money in itself cannot give you joy. Okay, that's not where it's at. But if you use that money, okay, God will use that to bear fruit, and then you're going to have joy. In fact, he'll keep the money coming so that you can keep giving away so that you can keep having even more joy. It's almost like he's going like, how much do you want? You keep giving away, I'm, you're just like a pipeline now. Now I can trust you, and I'm going to keep giving it to you and giving it to you because you keep giving it away. Now, it doesn't mean you get, oh, only poor Christian, uh, Christians, you got to live in a cart, you can't have nothing nice. No, take care of your basic needs. But listen, God gives us an abundance to do something with. And if you do it his way, man, you really have to pay somebody to slap the smile off your face. Now, I didn't say it. This is what he says here. You hear me quote this every time we take an offering because it's Bible, right? Remember this, Paul says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give. Some Christians give more, some less. There's no secret number. There's no secret math. It's just whatever's in your heart. Right? Not reluctantly or under compulsion. You feel guilty or you have to or somebody's staring at you. No, that's legalism. For God loves a cheerful giver. Now, he who supplies God seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your store of seeds so that you can go out and uh, buy an even uh, larger swimming pool. 19 of them now. You've got 18 Cadillacs. And that's... No, why is he doing it? He'll increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You're doing something for the Lord with that. You will be made rich in every way so that you can what? Be generous. Give it away. The extra on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in what? Thanksgiving to God. So Paul says, how much joy do you want? Right? Money can't give you joy. But when you use it for the things of the Lord, it will give you joy. Now, I didn't say that. Uh, God did. And again, this is storing up treasure in heaven. This is the same principle. Matthew 6, uh, 19, 21, 24. Do not store for yourselves, Jesus speaking, treasures on earth. Right? Don't think that money's going to give you joy. It's not all about this. All your edifices, all the things that you buy, all the, it's all going to burn up. 
Don't live for just that. Right? Where moths and rust destroy, where thieves can break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure where? In heaven. Why? Because it's eternal. It lasts forever. Where moths and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your what? Treasure is, there your heart will be also. Basically, the scripture is saying this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Listen, you cannot. It's an, it's an act. You absolute. you cannot. Don't even be tempted with the thought. You can't serve both God and money. Make up your mind. If you only had enough money, make up your mind. Because you can't serve both. And basically what the scripture is saying, listen, we demonstrate to God that we really love him. By demonstrating to him that we have only one master. And even when it comes to money, that we demonstrate to God that money is not our master. He is our master, even though he is the one who gives us our money. But he is still our master, not the money. And the way we demonstrate that is we freely give away. As he prompts us to. Right? And when we do that, you get, here's my, here's my point, here's where we're going. You get joy. Now listen, money can't give you joy. That's the first point. Be thankful that God has shown you that money can't give you joy. But when you give it away, this is what we miss. Oh, it's fun. It is joyful. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus did, right? Do we take him in his word, right? Acts 20, 35, Paul says this. In everything I did, Paul says, I showed you that by this kind of work, a kind of hard work, we what? We must we must. It's an imperative. I have to. We got to help the weak. Why? Because we're remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. It is more blessed to receive than it is to give, especially at Christmas time when it's supposed to be about his birthday, but it's all about me and how many presents can I get? Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong translation. It's more what? Blessed to give than it is to receive. What's the word there? Blessed? It's makarios. And so Jesus is now saying, listen, the more you give away of the wealth that I give to you, as Paul says, you're not only, uh, uh, God's going to keep supplying that so you can give more because now I can trust you. And then you're not only stacking up the eternal investment, treasure in heaven, but when you do it, the act of giving it will give you joy. Riches won't bring you joy, but giving away will give you joy. You see, you got to be kidding me. And again, you put it all together. He's, it's up to you. How much joy do you want? You want to just do a little? You get a little joy. You want to do a lot? You get a lot of joy. I want a lot of joy. Let me, let me give you an example of how this happens. And I'm not saying this to boast whatever. I'm just going to give you an example. My wife and I uh, uh, in, in, are giving. There's, I, I'm not going to tell a bunch of stories because that may come across as being arrogant or whatever, but we, we like to give. Uh, and it ain't just, you know, it's just whatever God, you know, because he does. You've probably experienced it. He prompts it on your heart. And you just give it. And when you do, it's what? It's, oh, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> no, It's joyful. Let me give you one. And he talked about you, you just give a little, you, get, you, you reap sparingly, if you, you know, but if you give generously, you agree. Oh, and and you, you're, you're more blessed, you've you got more joy, spiritually prosperous when you give it than you receive it. Presents are cool, that's nice, but when you give it, oh. Let me give you an example. It was a, another place where I pastored, and we, we come across the news that one of the elderly ladies in the congregation, who was a widow, uh, and uh, all by herself, she, she didn't have much, and she was like, down to like, hardly anything to eat. I mean, bad. She just had it because she, she can keep the electricity going, but that, she ain't got no food. So we found out about it. Didn't say nothing to nobody. God prompts her heart. And so we, we loaded up boxes, right? Not, not a box, boxes of food, all kinds of food. Dried food, good food, meat, non-chicken related, by the way, because we really care about people, <laughs> right? And uh, but box, our whole trunk was loaded with food just for this one lady. And we were just, we were already starting to experience the joy. And we didn't tell anybody, because what's the scripture say? When you give, be like the hypocrites and make a big announcement of the trumpet. Da -da -da, I'm about ready to give. Look at me. You do that, you got your reward. The applause of men. But when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And Jesus says, I'll reward you with joy. And so we did. We loaded up the trunk. Man, we got, I mean, a whole big old trunk full of food. And we deliberately parked around the corner so she couldn't even see our car. And she lived in this older kind of dilapidated house, had this wooden kind of shady front porch there on the deal. And so we're, we're literally laughing as we're carrying these boxes of food, right, sneaking 
around the corner to her house. We're putting one there, and it's like creak, 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 creak. And, like, oh, she goes, yes. and we're making trips back and forth because we gave her a bunch of food, right? And they're there, and we're like, oh, I hope she doesn't hear us. So we finally, you know, she didn't come out, praise God. And so we get there and put the last box there, and then we, and like, ah, we're running. I feel like we're you know, doing the things as teenagers and, you know, knocking on people's doors. <laughs> we were having so much fun, and we got in the car. <laughs> Yeah, we just laugh and even tell the story fills with a joy. And I'll never forget. And we didn't tell nobody. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. And that Sunday, we weren't expecting it. That Sunday, she gets up. She says, I have to give a testimony to God's faithfulness. I didn't tell anybody, but he knew my need. And I had nothing left. I come out my front door. And there were boxes and boxes of food. And you know what? Just like Paul says, and God got the glory. God got the glory. And of course, at that point, we stood up and said, it was us! It was us! No. Joy. Do you get it? We say we get it. But you know what we end up acting like? We act like this dumb monkey. Right, watch this. When a Mahalakhari ventures into the deep Kalahari on a hunting trip, first he laboriously drills a hole in a giant ant heap when he is sure a baboon is watching him because he knows baboons are incurably inquisitive. Next, he puts some wild melon seeds into the hole and works them in so that they drop into a hollow. Then he saunters off knowing the baboon is burning with curiosity. The baboon doesn't trust that human being at all, so he plays it cool. But he's dying to know what gives in that confounded hole. Finally, Mr. Inquisitive can't take it any longer. He's got to know what's in there. He reaches in, grabs a fistful, and now his hand's too big to come out. If he had the sense to drop the seed, he could free his hand. Now he lets go when it's too late. And now it's time for a Kentucky Fried Monkey. What a dumb monkey, man. What are you doing, man? Just let, the, let it go. Let your fist, you could have been free at any moment. That's us. We say we trust God. We even say, we even sing songs, Jeho and we sound like we're all like Hebrew experts or something. Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> What's that mean? God, my provider. He's my provider. And then he says, you want some joy? First of all, don't think that money in itself can give you joy. But the reason why I gave you extra plusias was so that you could extend that to other people in my name. Don't let your left hand know it, and I'll give you tons of joy. And we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what we're doing every day? We're like that dumb monkey. God pours it, and we go, oh. And then we walk around. <laughs> Filled, consumed with grief, sorrow, and pain. Just let it go. I'm not saying there are Christians of poor creatures, but if God's blessed you, and we've been blessed. Let it go. This is a trap. It'll kill you spiritually. It'll kill your joy. Let it go. Let it go. Don't be a dumb monkey. Let it go. Understand why he gave it to you. This guy, he got it right. A Christian doctor who was asked by a patient what he had done during the past week. And this was his reply. He said, on Monday, I preached the gospel in Brazil. Tuesday, I ministered among the Mexicans in southwest Texas. Wednesday, I operated on patients in a hospital in Africa. Thursday, I taught in a mission school in Japan. Friday, I helped establish a new church in California. Saturday, I taught classes in our seminaries. And finally, on Sunday, I distributed Bibles in Korea. And the patient says, what? How in the world can you be in so many places doing so many different things? And the doctor says, oh, no, 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 I wasn't. But you see, I hold the dollars that God enabled me to earn. And I channeled in them into other places. For his glory and honor. We say we believe that. 
But God's our provider. We get all hung up on, you know, the math. It's not a math issue. You know, we look at this pie chart. We say, well, God gets this piece right here, and I'm being godly. I don't know what your slice is. It's a matter of the heart. Some give more, some give less. I don't know. But just don't do this. I think that's going to give you joy. It never will, ever. And then that'll keep you from being a channel of blessing to experience real joy when you give it away. But we're all hung up on that pie thing. And frankly, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't even give God any of his pie back. Like these guys. Remember this one? ありがとう the pie. songs about it, Jehovah Jireh. Who's our provider? We laugh because that's what? True. Here's what's sad. Don't miss the point. How come God doesn't get any of his pie? As if he can't see and he doesn't know our heart. We say the right thing. Oh yeah, money can never give you riches. Oh yeah, the world's they're, they're trying to Put that in our heads that, you know, if I only had enough, then I'll be happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know that I can have joy if I learn to give. But we don't. We don't. So you can say it all you want. But you're doing the exact opposite of what Jesus said to do. It's more what? Makarios. Remember, blessed, spiritually prosperous with joy. You want more joy? Then start giving. That's your focus. God, use me as a channel of blessing. The more you give, the more I'm going to give it away. In fact, that's why I want you to give me more, because I want to give more away, because I, this joy is just unspeakable. Unfortunately, I think most of us are doing what Paul said don't do. And we are on our own causing a lot of, what's the Greek word? Grief, odune. 
self-inflicted, consuming grief, sorrow, and pain. Because I'll say it again. This is the only time we get to do this. We are, as a born-again Christian, we're headed to a place where the pavement is gold. No more suffering, no more lack, no, none of the junk down here. It's all gone forever. This is just all temporary. But if you're poor, then you keep that in mind. I can still be joyful because it's not going to last forever in my current state. But if you've been given the ability to give away, then this is your only time to store up treasure in heaven. You don't store up treasure in heaven, and in heaven you're already there. You don't witness in heaven. You only witness. Do you see the point? If you got it, don't miss the point. Give it away for God's glory and for a witness to those around you. Because if you don't, one day you're going to wake up and realize I chose on purpose as a born again Christian the path that guaranteed me self inflicted, consuming grief, pain, and sorrow. And you want to see it in action? You want to see Odune in action? It's this guy. Remember him? Consuming grief, Odune. Consuming sorrow. Consuming pain. Why? Because you weren't the Tabernacle Christian. God put you on the other end of the spectrum. He made you a Plusios Christian. But you realized too late the trap that brought destruction. Thinking that money in and of itself can give you joy and it can't. And then you clamped onto it like that monkey and realized I wasted my opportunity and I can't get it back. 
One day in heaven, folks. Praise God, we're going there this morning in Christian. This is it. We're living it live. There is no second chance. And basically, James is saying, don't squander your opportunity. Let me give you one more analogy. And you think, well, hey, that just affects me. It's not, I mean, that's a little too dramatic there, Pastor Billy. It's supposed to be a cheerful Father's Day thing. What are you doing? <laughs> True story. We say we know that riches can't give us joy. And we say that we give God his pie. But here's what happens when you don't. And again, it's not a monetary amount. But when we all work together, whoever, whatever, between you and God, we could do great things, can't we? But if you don't, this is what happens. True story. One guy said, we put an extension on a school at an orphanage a few years ago in Africa to handle some of the extreme cases we found out were going on down there. And we were going to bring in a doctor with vitamin pills and extra food. And we were going to take these kids that belong to nobody and gather them all up. They slept in doorways. They're on the verge of death. They probably would have been dead in five to six months if they didn't receive immediate care. And so we were going to go down there, gather them up, bring them to this extension that we had built on the orphanage and, and, and had built to care for them and nurse them back to health. And so the day came, we came to go pick them up. And I went with the, uh, my associate in a bus and we drove to the place where all these children were assembled. And we thought there was going to be probably about 50 in the community. Uh, but when we got there, there was 300 of these kids. 300 kids that belonged to nobody with their swelled stomachs, their emaciated bodies, their black hair having turned rust colored from malnutrition. 300 of them, but we only had room for 50. He said, you know what I had to do. You know what I had to do. I had to stand there, people, he said, and out of that 300, I had to pick 50 to live, and you can't pick 50 to live without simultaneously choosing 250 to die. And I did what I had to do when we loaded those 50 kids on that bus. And I, I stayed behind with the other 250. And I, I tried to cheer them up. And I tried to talk to them. I, I tried to get them to sing some songs. And, I, and then before I realized what I was doing, I got them to sing this gospel song. And, and they were singing before I realized it. The gospel chorus, God is so good. God is so good. And then they go into the stanza. He Loves me so. These dying kids with their swelled stomachs and their falling out of hair, their emaciated bodies. He loves me so. And I'm, they're singing that and something inside of me screamed. And I said, God, this is not good. God, why is this happening? And as sure as I'm here, he says, I sense God say, I am good. And I do care. But you know why this is happening. And I said, I had to admit, I knew why it was happening. Because God in his care and his love is given to the church resources to respond to the needs of the world. And if the world is still in need, then it means the church is not responsible and as faithful as it should be. We're doing a lot, but we're not doing near what we should because God has given us the ability to be instruments that responds to the needs of the poor and the oppressed. That's what happened. And you wonder why we don't have joy? If we each gave of our tongue and invited one person a week, just here at sunrise, we could turn Las Vegas upside down just like that for Christ. All it takes, just give. Give your tongue. If we gave our time and talents to the service of God, we wouldn't have a vacancy problem. We'd have all kinds of ministries going on. Souls would be getting saved right and left. If we give our treasure, which no rule, no mathematical formula, it's just whatever between you and God. But we were consistent. Man, we wouldn't, we, we'd have all kinds of new ways to reach our community, programs, ways that we, you and I could be better discipled, share the gospel like never before, even on top of what we're already doing in new and exciting ways. If only we would do what we say we do. Stop being a monkey. Be a Christian. The reason why God gave it to you, yeah, take care of your needs. Doesn't mean you gotta live in a, in a box. Doesn't mean you gotta drive a 1972 Pinto. Because those things are dangerous. Remember that? In the back end, the gas tank there? But he gives you extra to what? Give it away. And experience joy.
like my wife and I. Just giving away food. What else? What else is out there? What other opportunity? Be sensitive to God's spirit. What's he calling you to do? What's he want you to do? Do it. And experience that joy. And then you prove you're the real deal. And that's how he wraps it up as we close. James 1, 12b. You will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You're not saved by your works. You're not saved by giving money. What's the context? All that we've seen in the first 12 verses, you've proven that you're the real deal. You've gone through trials. That's the great leveler. Everybody, saved and unsaved, is going to go through trials. But you proved that you weren't a faker in the midst of the church because you had joy in the midst of your trial. You submitted to God in the midst of that trial. You let it finish its good thing because you didn't want to take a lap. You went to God. You sought his wisdom in the midst of your trial. Who cares what the world says? God knows what's best. I'm going to him. And whether you were one extreme or the other, extreme poverty, or you were well-to-do as a Christian, I was living for eternity. That's what Christians do. And you get blessed, and you receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You stood the test, you're the real deal. It's reward time. The point is, don't squander your opportunity to be a joyful witness for Christ. Get it right. The first and only time. Now, believe it or not, in the next verse, we're going to get into a whole different acid test. These first 12 verses was just trials. You know what the next one is? We'll get to that next time. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, we love you and thank you so much again for, man, this has been a journey in these 12 verses. And hopefully we get it and and, and that we don't get it wrong because, as we see, it leads to a, man, what a waste of time and life and opportunity. And we're never going to get it back. But may we be those faithful Christians, those godly examples, bearing much fruit. We're not responsible for somebody else's behavior. We're not responsible for some other church, some other portion of your body, but we're responsible for us. Help us to be those faithful, true born-again Christians, living for you, being those positive witnesses wherever we go, and bearing much fruit, which is your will. That souls can be saved, lives can be changed for all eternity. Nothing else matters. May we be full of your joy and not the grief that we saw. Because it's going to be one or the other. If we're off track, get us on track today. And God, as always, if there's anybody here who's not truly born again, I don't know the heart, but you do. I can be fooled, but you can't. You tell us that you are holy, that we are not. The wages of our sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell, myself included. That's what we deserve, if we're honest. We've all sinned and fall short of your glory. But you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And it was his death that you provided for us so we could be fully, freely forgiven. And if we would just ask you, Jesus, to forgive us and believe in our heart that, God, you raised Jesus from the grave and confess Jesus as Lord, you tell us we'll be saved. If there's anybody who needs to do that today, God, would you please save them? May they receive, again, the greatest richest gift of all, the gift of eternal life. So we ask and pray all this in your wonderful name.